Moms addicted to drugs come clean. Tomorrow's Oprah. This is ABC 7 News at 10, Chicago's number one news. Breaking news, an Amtrak train headed for Chicago derails. At least one person is dead, 12 others reported critical. Good evening, dozens of other passengers also hurt, their injuries less serious. The train was traveling from New Orleans to Chicago when it derailed in rural central Mississippi near Yazoo City. ABC 7's John Garcia tonight joining us live from Union Station with late developments. John. Kathy, the train was due to arrive in Chicago at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Amtrak officials say they are still working on a lot of the details at this point. They believe, however, there were about 70 passengers on board, 12 crew members on board uh, the city of New Orleans train when that accident happened. They do not have information at this point about what may have caused the derailment or whether there was a collision with anything, but a number of the nine cars in the train wound up on their sides off of the track. It happened just after 6.30 this evening, about 20 miles north of Jackson, Mississippi. Passengers could feel quite a jolt when the train hit something. Paramedics, uh, at last word, were... Uh, treating at least a dozen seriously injured passengers and we're getting word of at least one person who was killed. All of a sudden we hit a hit the train track. We hit some on the train track and the train just tipped it all over. It threw two old ladies was on top of us. Mark Magliari is a spokesman with Metra uh, with Amtrak, my apologies. At this point, what do we know about any possible number of passengers from Chicago? There were 105 reservations on that train, but dozens of people were boarding up line, including places such as Memphis, Champaign, and Carbondale. So the number of people who were ticketed to Chicago is not yet available. Okay. What happens next with the investigation? We'll be working with the Federal Railroad Administration, which is our regulatory agency, and if they wish, the National Transportation Safety Board has the option of getting involved. We'll be working with them, too, and most importantly, caring for those passengers whose trips have been interrupted, working with them and their families. And we have an 800 number we've given you for people to call for more information. Right, Mark, thank you very much. Mark with Amtrak. Uh, the train at that point could have been reaching a maximum speed of about 79 miles an hour. Again, though, we do not know if it was going at that maximum speed or what may have caused this accident. Live outside Union Station, John Garcia, ABC 7 News. Ron, Kathy, back to you. Okay, John, thanks. And Amtrak has tonight set up an 800 number for families who have questions and want to get more information. Numbers on the screen right now. It's 1-800-523-9101. Joining us by phone now, Amy Carruth, the spokeswoman for the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency in Jackson. Ms. Carruth, do we have indications now that all the injured people are being cared for? No one is left trapped in the train? No, at this time, nobody is trapped in the train. The uh, fire department has done a second clean sweep walkthrough, uh, checking the train to make sure that there are no passengers left on the train, and we have confirmed that the train is empty. Ms. Kurth, with all that's going on in the world today, everyone tonight wants to know what caused this. Do you have any indication at this point? No, ma'am. Not at this point. We do not have any indication. We are working with local law enforcement. Um, we uh, got FBI representatives that have, have been dispatched to the area to work with the local law enforcement, to work with the Amtrak officials to see what may have caused the derailment of this train. Um, there was no collision. There was no weather. Um, incidents that could have caused the situation. We've had very dry, um, beautiful weather <laughs> down here in South Mississippi, so at this point we're not sure what caused the, the train derailment. And can you confirm the numbers we were given? One person reported dead, perhaps 12 critically injured, is that correct? That is correct. We do have one confirmed uh, dead one confirmed dead. We have about 12 to 15 that are critical injured. We had 56 people with minor injuries that were set up at the triage location um, at the command post as people were exiting, exiting the area and trying to get to safety with the Red Cross and our local hospitals have set up triage areas. Okay, Amy Carew, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we, of course, will have the latest on the train derailment tomorrow morning starting on our morning news. That's at 5 a.m. And now to Iraq. One of the deadliest days for U.S. troops since the occupation began. At least 12 Marines killed in an attack near the town of Ramadi, and it comes as another local family grieves for a soldier killed last weekend. We begin with ABC 7 Cheryl Burton and late developments on today's casualties. Cheryl? Well, Ron, one U.S. military official called this fighting ferocious, and it marks the first major outbreak of violence between the U.S.-led occupation force and the Shiites since the fall of Baghdad one year ago. Authorities believe this opposition is inspired by Muqtada al Sadr and his militia or a loyalist to Saddam Hussein.
In the town of Ramadi, outside the governor's palace, U.S. Marines were attacked by wave after wave of Iraqi insurgents. The firefight lasted several hours, resulting in enormous casualties on both sides. At least 12 Marines were killed. It is not known who the attackers were or if the attack was related to fighting underway in nearby Fallujah. U.S. troops moved into that city searching for those responsible for the murders of four American contractors last Last Wednesday, within minutes of their arrival, they came under fire. Reporter Darren Mortensen is traveling with the Marines. Three solid hours, there was machine gun fire from two different parts of the city, just nonstop. There was a patrol out just just in front of the Marines' uh, position on the outside of Fallujah, and they were they were hit hard. There was a Marine who took a serious wound. Um, Almost immediately, uh, another Marine wounded a few minutes later. The insurgents were in groups of 50 on the streets and inside buildings, firing assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades. Air support was called in. AC-130 gunships, fighter jets, and Apache helicopters. The Marines continued pounding targets with machine guns, mortars, and tank rounds. I uh, think big, big battles around two mosques here in the north uh, north side of town. There's been uh, a couple a couple 500-pound uh, uh, bombs dropped. Uh, serious combat. The Marines are determined to find those responsible for the murders and mutilation of the four Americans last week. They have photographs of a good many people who were involved in the attacks against the, uh, the individuals. Well, U.S. officials tell ABC News 12 suspects have been captured, including one man believed to be directly involved in the murders of the Americans. And Kathy and Ron, late tonight, the president released a statement saying, our resolve is firm, our resolve is unshakable, and we will prevail. Cheryl, thanks. And before today's violence, other soldiers were killed in weekend attacks in Iraq, including an Army private from northwest Indiana. Residents of Griffith, Indiana, have been stopping at the town's war memorial to mourn native son John Amos. Amos grew up in Griffith before moving to Valparaiso. The 20-year-old soldier, soldier was killed in Kirkuk on Sunday when an explosive device hit his Army truck. I just kept denying and denying it, but now it's just it's here. It's I think about it when I sleep, I think about it when I'm awake. A lot of hurt, you know, I'm kind of angry, mad. You know, we have two younger brothers and that's really, really hard because they don't understand. Amos's name will be engraved in Griffith's War Memorial. He is the second soldier from that town to die in Iraq and from the 21st from Indiana. Private citizens are also putting their lives on the line in Iraq. They're armed, often former military personnel. They go into combat still and sometimes pay the ultimate price. A look at their role in Iraq coming up on Nightline right after this newscast. And still ahead here tonight, more photo ops for criminals. Chicago police installing more of those cameras and they're even more high tech. Also, presidential candidate Ralph Nader visits Chicago and explains why a vote for him is not a wasted one. Amber Alerts have reunited some families, but disappointed others. Our special segment tonight looks at how well the system is working as it marks a milestone. And Jerry says don't get used to these 70 degree temperatures quite yet. The change is on the way. I'm Judy Sue. And I'm Jose Sanders. Tomorrow, the hottest high-tech toys for summer. Plus, how cars would change if women rule the road. And the newest fashions for the prom. I'm Tracy Butler, and hold on to those sweatshirts. Cooler weather is coming. Uh, and Ross says all the travel times tomorrow, beginning at 5 a.m. Nobody works harder for you than Remax. That's why nobody in the world sells more real estate. Traveling with the family just got a little easier. With the ATA Kids and Seniors Sale. Special low fares for kids and great sale fares for seniors. The ATA Kids and Seniors Sale. So I'm gonna go easy, go ATA. I'm gonna go easy, go ATA.
So today's my division's compliance and ILA meeting, and I gotta get the CEO, CIO, and CFO to talk to IT about integrating HSM with SAN, NAS, DAS, and JBOT to talk over FCIP and TCP IP. Then we gotta make it work with our BC and DR plans to get the best ROI and TCO, so we're okay with HIPAA, SOX, and the SEC. For information lifecycle management solutions that can guide you through the alphabet soup of compliance, count on Forsyth and top partners like EMC. So? So you better call those guys I use the SAP. Or are you gonna be SOL? Forsyth, delivering the business value of IT. Style, as seen in elegant department stores, finer men's shops, exclusive kids' stores. Or altogether at Marshall's, minus the theatrical lighting and dramatic prices. ABC 7 News at 10 continues with Ron Majors, Kathy Brock, Cheryl Burton, weather with meteorologist Jerry Taft, and sports with Mark G. and Greco. It may sound as if Big Brother is watching, but Mayor Daley says more police cameras installed throughout Chicago will make the city safer. Fifty more remote-controlled cameras will be set up. They'll even be able to detect gunshots. ABC 7's Kevin Roy reports. Let's see if we can... Out on patrol tonight on what used to be the mean streets of Chicago's west side. But 11th District Officers Paul Kopaz and Irvin Gardner say Chicago no, Avenue isn't the heart of the drug trade anymore because of Operation Disruption. Remote controlled cameras have practically shut down the open air drug markets here. I can't express enough how much different this is. You know, you don't have people blatantly out selling drugs, drinking liquor rolling dice. Since 30 cameras with flashing blue lights were installed last summer, drug-related police calls have declined 76 percent in surrounding areas. So police announced today 50 improved cameras will be added and the existing ones retrofitted with so-called gunshot detection technology, which can pinpoint gunshots within 20 feet. The pods then transmit to the surveillance center an alert that shots fired have occurred. So far, the American Civil Liberties Union hasn't objected to the way police are using these cameras, but with so many of them being added now, what is the future of this brave new world? Mayor Daley said today he'd like to see them all over the city eventually, even in parks. Where anything is a public way. And eventually, you have to use this technology for everyone. Some say the public support for these cameras might change if more of them pop up in places where we expect at least some privacy. And at least one constitutional law expert says we should be concerned about what happens to these images. Can anyone search it later? Can anybody in the department search it? How long are these records kept? We don't know and we should know. But for now, police say the streets are safer so more cameras will be watching. On the west side, Kevin Roy, ABC 7 News. The additional cameras will cost $2.8 million, but won't cost taxpayers anything. The money comes from assets seized from drug operations. Ralph Nader is in Chicago tonight trying to boost his campaign for president, but he has a long way to go. He told an enthusiastic crowd at Columbia College tonight that he's running for two reasons. He thinks the major parties let big corporations run America, and he believes President Bush lied about the war in Iraq. Many Democrats accuse Nader of costing Al Gore the election four years ago, which may make it tougher for Nader this time around. I don't want to throw away my vote. That's, that's the uh, toss-up. That's the problem. Well, the only time you waste your vote is when you vote for someone you don't believe in. We should all vote our consciences. In the next couple of months, Ralph Nader has to collect a million and a half signatures to get on the ballots in all 50 states. Just ahead, Jerry says before the week's out, it's going to feel a lot less like spring. But first, the one-year anniversary of the enhanced Amber Alert system and changes to make it more effective. Also, milk, it may be good for your body, but not for your wallet these days. What's behind the high prices? And in sports, Greg Maddox is set to make his first start for the Cubs and the White Sox looking to restart their season with Esteban Lewis. It is not an abstract concept. It is not a financial instrument. Energy is a concrete thing.